is Sean Bear. I'm from uh, Iowa. I work at the National American Indian, Alaska Native ATTC, MHTTC. I'm uh, from the Musquaki tribe. I'm uh, from the Bear Clan. My native name is Kiuka. Um, Christina could be here today. I think you probably knew that. She has some problems in her family and she can take care of. So. But uh, presenting with me here too is uh, Dan Foster. I'm Dr. P. Dan Foster, Macho Pedro, Nahari Uri, Tante Garcia, Nambi Chihuahua. I said the sun is really, no, I, I, greeted, <laughs> I greeted you as relatives and, and said that my hand wasn't sweaty, you know. Hey, <laughs> oh, good to meet you. <laughs> That's obviously what you said. <laughs> Thanks for laughing. My kids say, keep your day job. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you media <laughs> Yeah. That's the advice. I don't know if any of you know he was one of the uh, Native American Olympians. Uh, Real modest about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the older I get, the better I was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's done a lot of work with our center. Uh, does a lot of things with us in presenting mental health, uh, a lot of different things with uh, veterans and uh, cultural inclusion and stuff like that into mental health and a lot of stuff like that. We asked him to come and help, but especially since Christina couldn't be here. But, uh, need it worked out. <laughs> so this is going off of the key component number four, treatment and rehabilitation. So Wellness Group provides access to holistic, structured, and phased alcohol and drug abuse treatment and rehabilitation services that incorporate culture and treatment. So when we look at this, because we want this to be more of a discussion, so what is important information to gather for a Native American client? I know on here they talk about culture and or tribal identification. Also, which I included was self-identity. Because a lot of times when we're working with tribes, sometimes there are people within the tribe that maybe they're not, they don't feel comfortable like, uh, like with the elders. They don't, might not feel comfortable out in public. And like with tribal council or politics, maybe they don't attend... Uh, you know, the ceremonies, maybe they just tend to, or just spin around like with their peers. So sometimes they may feel and say they're native, but the way they identify might be different. They might feel comfortable around certain peoples and not so comfortable around others. But also when we look at this, <clears throat> there are people maybe, well you've seen like a, uh, maybe grandparents way before they had left for work programs to work in the cities. So, and a lot of that was to remove natives from tribes and to hopefully so they won't come back. That was part of the agreement. But later we're seeing either their children or grandchildren coming back to the tribes. But a lot of times maybe the way they identify might not be the same way that somebody who's been living there all their life may. So that's something we're kind of looking at. And uh, what we're wondering, um, from your point of view, what is important information to gather for a Native American client? Because right here we see culture and tribal identification, but also self-identity. What do you think is important to gather for these? So I know, like, uh, for our Rocky Boy Reservation, we only take tribal. Like, okay. we take the Okay. So if you are non-tribal, it's we really don't look at your cases. I mean, it just depends. We, we will if we need to, but okay. we rather just do our enrolled members. Okay, okay. Would you say spiritual or religious uh, backing or background? Um, that's part of it, yes. I mean, it's just, uh, like, definitely spiritual or... You know, whether they go to a church, whether they go to ceremony, whether they choose another way. I mean, a lot of that is very important. 
because when we're looking at treatment plans, we're looking at a lot of what we're going to do with them, it's important that they feel comfortable with what they're doing. Because there are natives, I mean, they might be fully native, but they may not want the culture. You can have somebody who might not be that native, but they were raised traditional all their life, and that's what they would choose. That's one of the questions uh, you want to ask anyone. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter who they are, but what do you want me to know about your religious or spirituality, and also what would you like incorporated into your treatment mm -hmm. and your values and your beliefs? And yeah, that's what okay. I start out with. Did you have something? You're an imposter. <laughs> <laughs> they died generations ago. You're large. <laughs> okay. Just a comment on this, Sean. And mm -hmm. I'm a boarding school guy, and so, uh, and I, I'm, I was Casper in the fifties. And Tikalawa Shichuaglaki Lakoto Waglaki Washte. I didn't speak English. I only spoke Indian. I lived with my grandfather. And and he didn't speak English, so everybody spoke Indian around him. I bring that up because, so I was treated as retarded, so I, I wasn't, uh, I didn't go in a classroom. I, one of my older brothers taught me English. They wouldn't let us speak Indian. Those are true stories. They would hurt, hurt us. My ears still get infection on my left ear. That was one that got pulled. Because I'd be asking, what do they say? You know, how do you say that or whatever to my cousins, my brothers. I had relatives there and quite a few, a lot of us. In the 50s, most of us could still speak Indian. Not, not now. Not now. A lot, of, a lot of times people know a little bit of song and this and that. Where I'm going with this, though, is we had, there we had chapel every day. Bible study every day. Church three times a week. Now, we were also getting molested and whatnot by some of those preachers. So I wasn't exactly an enthusiastic convert. But it surprised me even the concept of spirituality. Because can you imagine if we didn't have gravity? How would we negotiate this meeting? And we don't think of gravity, but my hunch is every one of us is experiencing it about the same. And in Lakota and what Lakota we say that everybody is equal to Unchimaka, to the earth, to grandmother. Everybody. Well, for us, spirituality is everybody is equal to creation. By virtue of your life, your life is proof that you're creation. And so whether you feel it or not. So to us, that's spirituality. You can't see it. Will a fart get rid of spirituality? Will a, <laughs> will a burp? Will a, will a bad word? Will a holy word? No. Spirituality, <clears throat> gravity connects us to earth. Spirituality connects us to life. Well, that's Wolokota. But in the dominant society, we confuse that with religion. In the Indian world, for example, the smartest person in a room might be the one with the broom over there. In the white world, it's the one with the PhD. I was so much smarter once I had a PhD, and I'm light skinned anyway. My wife always goes, quite right, quite right. She'll say something, they just ignore it. My wife's dark. <laughs> I'll say it, and everybody go, ooh, ah, ooh. <laughs> you know? You're white right, she say. But I just want to mention that with spirituality and the relationship that you talked about. That's so important for us to get to know each other, to know, to know who we are on, on, on our terms. Not just fill in the form, take a seat, you know, which is so much part of this dominant society, so mechanistic, so impersonal. But what if the earth became impersonal all of a sudden and didn't hold on to any of us? Can you imagine trying to get to Tamarack Room or trying to avoid Aspen Room and grabbing this one and grabbing that braid, and this foot, <laughs> not looking up that dress and everything, you know. Just, so, so spirituality connects us to life. Just like gravity connects us to earth. And, and it's so important. So it's not religion. And you might have lots of religions in here. But we're all spiritual. <laughs> we're all connected to life. You're all alive. Thanks, John. Yeah, no problem. You guys are late. I need you guys to write a essay. <laughs> <laughs> 20 Our Fathers. You know. <laughs> Asking, uh, like, with um, what kind of information?
information is important to gather from Native Americans and clients or participants. Notice how Sean's taking time too, and for your white relatives, I don't mean to offend you, but when I first, I, I, I was an athlete, how lucky am I? <laughs> lucky, I loved athletics, and so I got to go to college as an athlete, and I didn't even realize I was crooked. <laughs> what I mean is, I had a vehicle and I had an apartment, and I, I just didn't want to leave home. I wasn't waiting for a higher bid. I didn't even know I was getting bid. So I had a nice little Mustang convertible in 1968, and Nice apartment over at Kirkland. I went to University of Washington. Why am I telling you that story? I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Shotster. <laughs> oh, it's about the conversation. So I didn't know these people, and so they'd ask me, uh, what's your name? You know, but for us, what's your name is who's your family? We locate you in relatives. And so I'd be taking my time kind of deciding which of my family am I going to tell, the outlaws, the in-laws, the Christians, the heathens, you know, the, the judge, the, the convict, you know, who am I going to say? And they'd start talking already. In other words, in our way, we wait. Sean was waiting, and he invited you again to speak. But in a dominant society, they don't wait. They give you 15 seconds, and, buddy, they're moving, you know. We give up to two minutes. I'm saying that because sometimes people might have really important things to share with you, Indian people. Sometimes we'll go inside. Sometimes if I'm talking real serious with you, I'm going to shut my eyes. I'm not even going to look at your eyes in order to give you that respect so that you're not talking to my nod, you're talking from your heart. So I can hear from your heart. And so this is an important part of working with us. Is, is, and you wouldn't even know, I must, my kids say, Daddy, they don't even know you're Indian. They think you're a biker or a hippie. But I <laughs> yeah, whatever. <laughs> so then I cut my hair, and we're on our res, ranchers don't talk to Indians, and Indians don't talk to ranchers. We've known each other all our life, right? So my sister dies, I put my braid in with her, and, uh, and I've kept it short ever since, but the ranchers are talking to me at the gas station, and I'm thinking, do you not know who I am? You know, I know who you are. I'm saying who I am, they go, yeah, we know, Dad, you know, we know. And then one of my cousins just walks right by, doesn't even look at me. I go, oh, oh I see how you are. Oh, Uncle Dan, you know, you know. <laughs> just with his short ears. You know. So don't be too quick to think you don't have an Indian sometimes, even when people look like me. Or that you have an Indian when someone looks fully full blood, but they don't identify. They don't, they don't they're not acculturated in that way. In fact, I got one of my brothers that just passed his nickname at boarding school, true story, little shit. And he don't like Indians. He raised his children on the res, went off and married this white school teacher, brought her back, and had two Indian kids, two white kids, and raised them on the res. But he don't like Indians. He probably voted for Trump. <laughs> Sorry about that joke. I'll never be invited again, so pay attention. <laughs> Every word you hear, listen to <laughs> And we do use laughter and tears for medicine. That's part of our medicine. Part of Creator's medicine to us. <laughs> oh, no, you're a clicker? No, my nose pad. <laughs> oh. It was just there. But you're being Michael Jackson, my nose. And so, <laughs> right there. Huh? <laughs> so here is something that we also use in some of the programs that we talk about. Because when we look at Native Americans all across the country, there are a lot of people who think that all Natives speak the same language, they believe the same. And they're all Still from women the, teepees. Yeah, yeah. Even though we never had teepees. But, um, yeah, so we have those who are maybe raised traditional, uh, maybe those who were raised or became acculturated, and those who were bicultural. Now, when the way I look at this, too, is that long before maybe we had grandparents um, living on a tribe, and they had joined... Uh, or got into the work program when they went to the cities. 
And then their children were raised more of the bicultural way because they were still learning the traditions. But over time, what happens is that, like, when well, he's talking about boarding school, talking about a lot of things like that way back, is that they were treated badly. And sometimes they did, those grandparents might not have wanted their children or grandchildren to go through the same thing. So they don't always teach them the tradition. They don't always teach them the language and all those things. They didn't want there to be a big difference so that they wouldn't be, uh, you know, labeled or singled out right away. And I heard somebody recently talking about that and said, well, when you stand out, then that's when they're going to, to pick on you. If you treat them or teach them this way, they'll be able to get along better. And that's the way my, my father had thought about um, us when we were growing up. Because when we were real little, all we did was speak um, our tribal language in, a, in the home. But once we began to go to school, and we were all in school, they stopped doing that. And it's because he said it was easier for people or us to learn English and sound more English when we learned that pretty early. Me, I was already speaking Meskwaki, but it was at a time when it's like I was getting things different somehow, and I had to transfer over to English. So I developed a stutter. And sometimes when I was talking, my lips would tighten up, you know, because I'm like, you know, it's like, you know, sometimes we're pointing at people. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, you know, maybe the way we do certain words. Like, we have words like bois and bui. And we're using a lot of our lips in the language. But with the English language, it wasn't so much. But my lips just wanted to work. <laughs> <laughs> so I would get caught in that. And I, was, I had a difficult time. But later on, I developed a stutter. And I don't know if that had anything to do with it. But so during the summer, between my eighth grade year and my ninth grade year, I realized I stuttered, and I hadn't known that all that time. Of course, they put me in special ed, um, took, kept taking me through language classes, reading classes. Um, of course, I knew all these big words and everything, but I was okay. But so all summer, what I began to do is to speak slower, to think about what I'm going to say. Sometimes I was practicing. And the teacher learned like not to call on me because I'm not the reason my name anyway. And I become very nervous and I would start to stutter. So speaking slower and, and talk, thinking about it before I speak really helped me out. So I got into ninth grade and I talked to my friends. I said, Did you know I stuttered all these years? He goes, Yeah, but it was uh, mostly when you got excited. He's like, how come you never told me I stuttered, you know? <laughs> and he goes, oh, I thought you already knew. <laughs> but I was like, oh, jeez, no wonder why. So, but I realized that over time. And over time, I began to just slow down my speech and stuff like that. And to learn to be able to think about what I'm going to say. So it's, it was very hard to become a presenter. But what I'm saying is that with that next generation, they become more bicultural, bicultural, walking into different worlds. Although many of the natives today are bicultural, even if you land more stuff, more on the traditional side or more on the acculturated side. But there are those maybe, and their children might be coming back now to the tribes, and they might not have all the knowledge that the who are living on the tribes now. It's like me, I was always growing up with the tribal languages, um, not so much the language, but different words and stuff like that, of course, but listening to people, um, ceremonies, the teachings, a lot of the traditional things, and spiritual things, and all the stuff like that I, I learned about. But it was usually only at home. 
for when we went to the ceremonies. But the thing about it is, I realize now, seeing so many other people coming back from the cities, how hard it must be for them. And a lot of times when we look at natives ourselves, it's like, oh, you're a tribal member here, so you must know this and this and this. But maybe we don't know enough of the people in our tribe. So we kind of look at this and to be able to help them because it's something we need to know about them. Because if they're not comfortable with the culture, because maybe when they were going to, let's say, church or whatever it is, boarding school, they beat that out of us and say, no, that's, that's not right. You can't do that. So a lot of times they become afraid of their own culture and their own belief system. But um, it's something we need to take into, a, into account when we're working with our clients, with our students, patients. Anything? Anybody would like to say? Just to comment on the okay. reservation, you can live on the reservation and still not know too much of your culture. Mm -hmm. On a reservation, we have pockets. <coughs> it really depends on what family you're into, what you're going to be introduced to, and what's uh, going to be actually lived. And, and you will be discouraged within a family. If you happen to want to move towards that traditional side, they'll try to pull you back. Or if you're from that traditional side and move towards this acculturated side, they will try to pull you back. Not, not so much because superior, not, not that stratification, but just to keep you close, just to, to keep you within the circle of Ochoco. So, so don't assume too much. This takes conversation. And also people change and evolve. And, uh, a quick story, when Custer died, he was really surprised. Uh, there was, <laughs> he went to heaven. And as he went to heaven, there was Indians coming in too. He did not expect that. And every time he saw an Indian, he kind of just, oh man, he just kind of shuddered, PTSD. But uh, uh, St. Peter said, don't worry. He said, you're going over where the pearly gates, the streets paved with gold, to the mansion. You're going to the happy hunting ground. You won't even see any Indians where you're going. In. And uh, uh, St. Peter was right. The further Custer got towards the city of, of gold, uh, less and less Indians he saw. He hadn't seen an Indian for quite a while. He's feeling pretty good, feeling kind of relieved. And suddenly he's seen the biggest Indian he ever saw with just a huge war bonnet and trailer going. He said, who is that? He says, oh, that's a god. He just wanted to be an Indian. <laughs> 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 True story. <laughs> it reminds me, it's like, as he's talking about it, they were always talking about Custer, and that uh, they were so upset with him, they wanted to take him to court, but his he got sued. <laughs> <laughs> but he did have a new, a new era of shirt on, and he told the people of BIA, he said, don't do anything till I get back. <laughs> So any of the BIA employees are part of that. <laughs> but there's a reason for that. No. <laughs> okay, so acknowledgement of native spiritual knowledge. So as tribal members across the United States, we understand that there are not only differences of knowledge, but also levels of knowledge when it comes to native spiritual or medicine knowledge and practices. As this is something that is normally passed on or learned under the tutelage of medicine people, the healers, or traditional leaders, and sometimes the family members. It is not something that you can always read from a book with full understanding that comes from years and years of study under a person. Medicine or spiritual gifts normally run in families. Now, one thing that's very important with this part, medicine or spiritual gifts run in families. We're looking at that from a diagnostic or diagnosis point of view in the DSM on mental health. What also runs in families? Trauma. Trauma. Okay. Mm -hmm. What else? Same diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. Illnesses, sicknesses, mental health disorders, all things like that. It runs in families. So a lot of times they might ask, it's like, do you has your parents or grandparents ever had problems with insects? Have you ever seen things or heard things that not everybody else did? Well, that's just an unfair question for natives anyway. But, so, <laughs> I mean, 
I talked to that with a doctor on the tribe before because I was like, you only heard this from these this one kid. It's like, you should go out to all the families, all the people, and I bet you'll find out that most of them are going to say they've seen something that nobody else did, or <coughs> something, or experienced something. Yeah. So a lot of that, it, it helped, I think, because he began to look at things a little bit differently, using cultural information when looking at um, helping people. I want to do emphasize that trauma is not an event, it's an experience. And so there can be three people at that event and one trauma. So, so please remember that. Don't assume trauma. Let, 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 let the person let you know. Don't, don't impose it on them. And so it's an experience. It's not an event. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, have you ever heard in psychology that said you are the sum of your thoughts? I want to say something to that okay. because one of the things that I tell my clients is trauma is anything that they experienced that affected them in an emotional way or a physical way, spiritual way, that's trauma to them. It might not be trauma to anybody else in the group, but it's trauma to them. So I always let them know, don't think that it has to be something drastic to be trauma. It's just something that caused you in any kind of way. Mm -hmm. That's trauma. So, you know, because a lot of them don't realize that they have trauma. Like, because, right. especially on a reservation, really it's call so it everyday <laughs> life, they don't realize that it's trauma. Mm -hmm. So I'm always telling my clients, you know, in that way, so they understand that they experience trauma. Yeah. And it really helps them, because then they can open up and kind of go, yeah, this happened to me. So it's just a way for it to open up and get them yeah, to You can them. see some of those things with little kids. Yeah. It's like if they really like a certain parent or, or somebody within the household, and they might be taking a nap and that person, they wake up and that person's gone. They're like, where did they go? You know, they left me. And it's like, I'm not going to see them again or whatever. So every time that person puts on their shoes, they run and put their shoes up. Or every time they're going to go anywhere near the door, they're running. Maybe they grab their shoes, jacket, whatever it is. But, you know, that's, that's very similar. <coughs> but going back to what I was talking about is that some people said we're the sum of our thoughts. And a lot of that has to do with cognitive um, theorists and stuff like that. Plus you have, we are the sum of our experiences. So that is like behaviorist. But what I began to think about is exactly what Dan was talking about. Is you can have two friends undergo the same thing in your life in their life. Be there and see something very tragic happen. Maybe a disaster. One of them might take that and thrive in their life because of it. One person might kind of give up and get into drugs, have problems in their life. And they're kind of like dysfunctional for the rest of their life. But the thing about it is that I began to think about this and say, I don't believe in any of these theories. I think they're both partially correct. But the way I see it was more of, I think they're the sum of the interpretations, their own interpretations of those experiences. So as we are individuals, we all go through things in our life. Sometimes we go through a hardship that makes us stronger. Sometimes we might go through a hardship that somehow weakens us. But if we take those things as they should and as we can, is to learn from them and grow. Sometimes we become a little bit more hardy. But this is something I wanted to kind of let known is that, you know, when we look at spirituality, there's also a medicine point of view, whether, because the spirituality is, yes, it's in part of everything we do. And when you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you have self-actualization like this at the top, right? Up here. But a lot of natives were starting there from the beginning. We start out with spirituality. 
Do you, do you hear how he's talking though right now? Oh, dang it, Sean, I told you not to do that. <laughs> One of the things that's different for natives and not natives is the we versus me. We come from a culture that everything's about I, I, I. That is not our culture. However dysfunctional we are, when we say, well, you know, I've heard people be so critical of native parents that are addicted. I'm not excusing the addiction and I'm not okay about the outcome, but that doesn't mean that parent doesn't love their kids intensely. They still have the relationship. You follow where in the dominant society, which is so me-oriented, sometimes there isn't a relationship. With, not like, because we, we are us. We are, we are always more than just I. Always. That's part of why we uh, get a hold of a person. Now, don't hit me. Okay. <laughs> Grab my wrist. Grab my wrist real tight. Don't, don't, don't hit me. Okay. Grab my wrist real tight. Oh, oh, come on, man. This is... Come on, Darius. All I have to do is move towards his thumb, and I can get away. He's much stronger than I am. But that's just a simple little Aikido. Most of you law enforcement people know about that. But I didn't know that when I was a little kid. People could grab me and get away, and all I had to do was do that. And so sometimes people have that ability to get away, and other people are held and taken by it. And so there's times we're trapped that we're not. And if he stood up, and I started shoving him to make a point, and then he finally clocked me, and all you guys with my lawsuit, you guys would all be on his side. <coughs> but my point would be he kept getting his balance. We're designed to get our balance. The homeostasis is a principle, and people want to have their balance. They want to be well. When you get sick, it wasn't the penicillin that healed you. Your body knows how to heal itself and fix itself. The penicillin helped, but your body knows how to heal itself. It knows how to fix itself. So does your mind, so does your spirit, so does your heart. In this dominant society, we always say you don't have that knowledge. We know that knowledge can come from the youth of It can come from plant nation. It can come from water, the Nemochoni. It can come from lots of different places. Uh, the buffalo eats medicines that the cow won't eat. I don't know if the sheep do or not. I know they're nervous <laughs> in eastern Montana. No, <laughs> 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 Don't laugh at me, guys, because then I'll just keep going, you know. And Sean's going to have to find a new helper. <laughs> say one more thing to that though he got that from the Blackfeet up, up on the Canada side Maslow but he couldn't present it the way the Blackfeet did do you know how the Blackfeet presented it as we are self-actualized not I am self-actualized and he couldn't he knew he couldn't sell that to Americans so he changed it but I still think that matters because we affect each other for better or for worse for positive or for negative and when one of us heals, we're all lifted a bit. And so I, I really like to see the hierarchy of needs. I mean, I think it's a wonderful concept. Mm -hmm. Thank the Blackfeet for that. Not the Amscopi Pakoni, but the ones on the north side. Okay? Some of you Black, who, any Blackfeets in here? <laughs> <laughs> I married to Becky Crawford from Hartmute, so. I, I, I know, and that was a mistake. I'll never marry a Blackfeet again. <laughs> She's a tough, tough lady. But, but it's about we, our actualization, our fulfillment, not collectively, not mine, individually. We're, le we're lessened, I think, sometimes by the, what's it called when you, the reductionism of, of, of some of our culture, American culture. I really like we. I love that. Us. I like us. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, I like that information. Talk like that it's kind of like the motivational interview. You might not be aware of it. When he was developing, he was going through a process of uh, tobacco cessation during the time when he was working with these tribes in the Southwest. At first, he had a hard time working with those people. But he learned to be able to speak with them differently, build a relationship with them. And out of that came motivational interviews. So it's very interesting how sometimes Maybe concepts or things people learn, it's like they take it somewhere else. And it could 
but it's very good. And my word's very good with many tribes. So why is it important to gather participants' cultural and or tribal affiliation information in tribal wellness courts? It's part of their recovery tactic. find out what approach to to combat their <laughs> addictions on. Thank you. Well, and to make sure that you're connecting them with people that they will feel connected with, mm -hmm. potentially. I worked with a young gentleman that was chronically relapsing, and we were trying to, I worked in the Missoula Court. We were trying to help find a way to get him connected with people, and he liked to do sweats. And they found a sweat lodge in Missoula, and they wanted him to go to that sweat lodge. And he's like, those aren't my people. I don't, I'm not going to get anything out of that lodge, mm -hmm. because they do things differently. That's not the way I was taught to do it. <coughs> so, yep, yep. Yeah, it brings a really good point. And that's no one yellow kidney that runs it, so I'll tell him next time. I'm really heat it up. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's very important because a lot of different practices within cultures of beliefs and things like that can be very different. Like, for instance, one tribe can be matrilineal and the other one matrilineal. And, you know, some things I don't really agree with because it's something you think about. That you can have two enrolled parents fully made have children and never get them enrolled because of that alone. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And so a lot of times around different tribes, like I come from Iowa, um, we're in the Great Plains, although I don't believe we belong in the Great Plains, I believe that uh, we believe with we should do it the Bemidji village, the Bemidji tribes, because our culture is so different, are so uh, similar. Like with uh, Aberdeen or Great Plains, it's even kind of similar up here. But, uh, and like when you go down south with uh, the Navajo, the Pueblo, um, the Hopi, the Apache, they have similar, similar things. But a lot of times when we look at, move around different tribes, you can't always take these two and mix them together and these two and mix them together because it's not always going to work. It's better to be able to find similarities around that area. And sometimes there are things that maybe somebody else is missing. Maybe somebody else has. <coughs> and that's what happened up in, like, New York area. I think a um, long time ago they had uh, the Abenaki, Abenaki tribe. Anyway, during a lot of the wars and stuff that was going on a long time ago, the Abenaki were very peaceful. They were all like learning medicine ways and healing. They wanted peace. So what they wanted to do was to leave. They didn't want any part of war because war does something to people. And they decided that one day they would come back and start again. Many generations later, when their descendants came back, they had forgotten a lot of things. While there were other tribes around the Abenaki that still remembered what the Abenaki people taught them. And they were able to give that back. And so, it's, and in some ways, it's really good to be able to share different ways or to share different things. But, you know, not everybody's always willing to do that. Especially like with um, definitely different further, right, different further away, very different. It's like sometimes you can tell just by the hair difference. It's like um, down south, you probably wouldn't see a whole lot of people with long hair hanging because they tie theirs up. And, um, you know, that has spiritual significance. You know, even with our tribe, if I go out and do a certain thing, different ceremonial stuff or practices, 
I tie my hair, but I use leather when I tie it. And with leather, I can't take it. Not spiritually. So, um, there are different kind of concepts, different things that can be similar among tribes, but not everything. So, when you're working with somebody from a different tribe, maybe a different area than where you're at, you might have to incorporate their ways to be able to help them. Okay, so, authentic and um, intentional use of culture and traditions in programming and treatment services. What does this look like? With what our relatives said, so I wouldn't give up on the sweat, but I'd, I'd seek to find another location that would be accessible. So, so that's 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 an important point. You know, if you're Baptist, you might not want to come to First Pentecostal Church. Why is it always first though? I want to go to Thirty Second Pentecostal, <laughs> but I've never found it. But I'll join that church if I find Thirty Second Baptist Church. I'll join it. <laughs> so, uh, he lose his play. What does this look like? <laughs> well, I can tell you the theory of the book that worked with. I just really honed in on who their tribe was mm -hmm. and asked who I could talk to and bring them in to okay. the treatment program. Cool. Cool. They would know better than I am just sitting here going, yeah, go to this sweat. Well, it's not the right tribe. <laughs> They could then tell me what would be appropriate they, and actually communicate. They might not even call it a sweat. Mm -hmm. you know, some call it exactly. a lodge, some call it a nipi. I mean, we have different. Call the sauna. Different <laughs> sauna. <laughs> She's Danish. You can only spot the Danish. ironic. I introduced you, my English name to you in Indian. So, Mato Witko in Machipelo. I'll go ahead and correct it now and give you my Indian name. Okay. But I won't translate it. <laughs> okay. How is this helpful to the Has, has anybody in here over 29? I don't want to. Have you, some of you that are over 29, have you noticed that life in a way gets easier as you become more authentic? When I was a child, I was always taught, it's awesome to be It's awesome to be an authentic person, to be you. It's awesome to be you. Don't try to be anybody else. Be you. Be you. It's awesome to be you. That's something that I think is universal for human, human beings. But when you have to live a lot of life trying to act like something other than you in order to not be put down, in order to not be sent to hell, in order to not be sent to juvenile, whatever. So it's really kind of cool to allow a person to be a whole person, a whole being, and to be not just themselves, but their kiwahi, kioshpai, oirate, their family, their clan, their, their community. How cool is that? So we're welcoming authenticity, we're welcoming truth, we're welcoming the whole person. So any of you that do that, thank you so much. Thank <coughs> you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. I can relate to what you're saying. Um, as an adult, I was finally properly diagnosed with PTSD. And um, basically, me feeling like I'm unsafe and going to be kidnapped at any moment. That's how my anxiety is. But a part of my healing has been being my most authentic self, whether everybody likes it, nobody likes it, 
what I believe in, how I perceive myself, my boundaries, everything. And how do you develop? Me, how do you want. evolve? Yeah, and it, it feels really good for my, my spirit and my healing. Like I've never felt more at home in my own body than I have before. Because before that's always like, I'm this imposter, or I have to play white to be treated good where I'm from. Or have so, to be normal. Yeah. You have to live as if you're okay when you're not. Mm -hmm. You have to live as so if you're after getting that you're proper pretending. diagnosis, yeah. proper therapy from another Native woman, um, I just see that being my most authentic self has been very helpful in healing. And um, I feel like I am, you know, ascending better with my spirit that way. Did you use EMDR? Hmm? EMDR? Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, Might be a light worker. No, um, yeah. most of the time it was just like um, a lot of like grounding techniques, mm -hmm. and then it's like self inventories, like just kind of scan my body. Okay. And then let it all flow out again. Mm -hmm. That, okay. I guess, just um, John and writing too. Yes, it helped a lot. Okay. But like I said, yeah, being myself has been the best. <laughs> we spotted all the CTSD. <laughs> so it's important to have that kind of person that <laughs> I have a question. Okay. So we understand that the like at some point it was shown that our cultures are going to be what heals us as a people, right? How do we bridge that gap from the what if the partner or the participant self identifies as native but doesn't participate in the cultural activities? How do we how do we merge that to bring them back? Or how do you... Look at what Sean's doing right now. Though. A lot of times in a Western way, all lecture, lecture, lecture. You put a fire hose to your mouth and boom, just blow up. But he's engaging you process-wise. So you can still do process even if someone's not participating in tradition. Have you noticed that sometimes we use tradition in small ways? <laughs> small process and activities and stuff. So much of Indian healing, round dance, we go sideways. Mm -hmm. So much of our healing, not just Indian people, but people, period. We heal sideways. We don't heal face off. We heal sideways. A little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here, a little bit there. 
so process, so focus on the relationship and, and, let, and keep listening. My uncle used to say, be the one who hears, not listen, hear. Hear what's said, hear what's not said. Hear, there, when we talk about rehabilitation, many of our relatives, not just, I, my wife and I decided, my wife's also, she's Blackfeet and Dakota, but she, we decided to practice on white people for 10 years and then go to the rest. Because people always come to IHS and practice on us, then they leave after four or five years. And they come back to visit, we adopt them and stuff, but they won't live with us anymore. So, but I was amazed, they were as messed up as us. It shocked me. I thought, geez, at least I know why we're messed up. Why are you messed up, you know? I just have to, just have to jack my jaw up every day as I'm listening to these things. And, and thinking, geez, you could be my cousin or my uncle or something. You're really messed up, you know? I'm so... I've got the right profession. I'll be busy all my life. But, but they're human things. They're people things is what I'm saying. And, and, and when we spoke of trauma, I said it's an experience. It's not an event. And So the trauma, one of the Vietnam vets I was working with, he was in heavy, heavy, heavy combat. And he'd gone, uh, you don't see it anymore, but he'd gone catatonic. You don't see catatonic schizophrenia anymore, but you did in the 60s, 70s, early 80s. When he finally started coming out, you know what had happened? He'd fallen in love with the young woman that he'd paid for company. And he'd fallen in love with her and she'd gotten pregnant. He was the son of a Baptist minister and he was horrified by his own moral guilt because she wouldn't come back with him. As far as she was concerned, it was a financial deal. It was not a heart deal. It was a moral injury. I, I didn't expect that. You, you follow? I mean, each person has their own and maybe he's having nightmares right now about violence. I don't know. But at that time, he, was, he had a, a, a horrific moral injury. He had, he, had, he had shamed a compass that he'd been brought up in that he had to adhere to. And so he, and that's, that's as legitimate as anything else. It is important that he heal from that. That was his injury. What a, what a, what a sweetheart man and what a good person he, he came out of his shell. One more funny story, though. So he sticks his head through this window at the VA hospital, and he's grinding his neck. I'm working as a psych tech, and they said, aren't you in your last year of your doctoral studies? I said, well, you come here and talk to him until the doc can talk to him. So I bust out another window about three down, and I, I won't even tell you what he said, because I didn't want to be next to him, but he already had that glass good into his throat, and he's grinding it back and forth, and he, he said... He said, there's something that I, I need to share, but, but you know, I, I really can't tell anybody. And I told him he could tell me anything. I'll never say that again. I will never say it again. The guy had a thing with chickens. Chickens, you know, I, I can't even eat fried chicken now. <laughs> I don't know what he would do in a powwow with all the bustles and stuff. It would drive him nuts. But anyway, so, <laughs> so I never tell people you could tell me anything. I don't believe that. <laughs> Especially when my head's through a window, too. I might start grinding myself. You just ruined a Sunday dinner for me. <laughs> it's funny what you're just talking about muscles. <laughs> talking about muscles made of uh, angel wings. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like, you ever heard that joke? <laughs> <laughs> Tell them the joke. <laughs> I don't know. It's like, I was with a couple of Indians. They go, the Rocky boy has hot sweats. And, 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 um, Guy says, okay, yeah, you guys have been good, come on up here, or whatever, but here they're going up there and they want to pow out and stuff, and they're taking angel wing, wings from the angels, or, or the feathers and stuff, and making muscles out of them. Hey, you guys can't be doing that, you know, as he talks in that way. He goes, hey, why don't you guys take these guys for a while and try to, you know, get some sense into them or something. It's a hot place. She says, okay, I'll take them. So he takes them. A little bit later, he's like, Hey, hey, you gotta you got take these Indians back. He goes, they're making me look bad. He goes, they're down there with all these hot rocks and they're saying, can't it get any hotter? <laughs> 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 That's kind of weird. That's a good one, Sean. Thank you. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> It's like we talk about that, and that's a very good point because of what comes up. And, you know, everybody has a choice in what they do, and a lot of times it's kind of our place to kind of accept that, however they do things, you know. 
sometimes we can hope all we want for somebody to realize something, but it all comes on its own time. You know, we never know what's going to happen in our life that might change us for a bit. So again, you start where the claim is at. Earlier I said something about rehabilitation, and I didn't finish it, but because for some of us it's not rehabilitation, it's habilitation. We were never there. But have you noticed that inside of people, just like the balance thing that I mentioned, I don't care if you never learn to be homeostatic, you'll automatic seek, automatically seek to regain your balance. It's, it's just within us to, to walk in balance. And it's within us to be loved. It's within us to be loving. You know, one of the things that bothers me with the meat cultures, how many parents here don't just adore your kids, and then you get grandkids, and then great-grandkids. My goodness, how awesome is that? How awesome is it to be the one who loves? It's awesome to be, do you follow? And that's within people who have never been loved. That's within people who have never really known, but it's still within them. And so we can still set that table. We can still be that relationship. We can be a part of it. We don't have to be the relationship, but among all of us, back to the point of it. The only way, did you know the downy feathers and the flight feathers are the same? Except for one thing, that flight feathers have like little hairs that adhere to the hair next to it. Huh? And that allows it to fly. The downy feathers don't. They can keep you warm, but they won't give you flight. For us collectively, the more of us that have that loving and caring that process, healthy relationship, authentic, we speak the truth, but we speak the truth as one who cares. That makes a difference in everybody's life. Mm -hmm. Even if they've never known that kind of relationship. My first wife, <laughs> so don't come to me for marriage counseling. <laughs> I, I married the girl of my dreams. You know, half breed, her mom spoke to Kota, her dad was a white guy, but good guy. Beautiful girl. Shoot, they were such a nice family. My family's kind of messed up, you know. I, I prefer a little drama, a little mess up for us, you know. <laughs> Within five years, I couldn't stand her, and she didn't leave me for 17 years, so I wish she'd have left us. <laughs> she finally left, so she said, well, thank you, thank you. Whatever you want, you know, I'll have it, I'll support the kids. And, hey, you know, the bag that's in the <laughs> I, I had, I had uh, uh, we weren't a good fit, but, but she's a really good person. And so even because someone's a good person, you might not have a good fit. And that's my point is we, we need lots of relationships. Mm -hmm. And we, we need, um, j just because something's good on paper, it's not necessarily going to work in life. But, but, but life will give that to you. Have, have you guys ever had someone you clicked with that wasn't even good for you, and yet they were? They, they were a good human being for life lessons and for growth. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's, that's part of what I'm talking about is the more kinds of process things that we can get people involved with that are habilitative, that are um, caring, <laughs> authentic, uh, that practice those skills, we all respond to it. We all get our balance. And I've seen the meanest people. I've, I've seen good kindness in them it, 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 once they feel safe. I decided I was going to commit suicide and I was in my 20s and we had two brothers that were built like refrigerators with lips and arms. <laughs> hey, guys, I won't say their names, some of you might even know them. And so this guy had been shot by my cousin because he beat my, his wife, who was my cousin's sister. <laughs> he beat her, so he shot him in the face with a 22, and all it did was drop his face. It just bounced off like a bear. <laughs> so he, he has, he's got a perpetual scowl. And so I just went up, I was drunk, and so I, I was kind of cussing at him, telling him what a whatever he was and stuff like that. Nobody talked to him and he was so glad to have a conversation. He just loved me. And so we became best friends. <laughs> and I ended up being friends with his brother too. So much for my death wish. <laughs> okay, I'm done. <laughs> it's kind of funny though, you think about it. A lot of tribes, they might have paternal tribes or maternal tribes, but you know, there's always usually a common kind of belief that I don't want to say it in a derogatory term. So I'll put this behind. Is that a lot of times when we learn of creation, we learn from things around us. It's like in creation, all things are balanced, right? Male, female, things like that. So and even in nature, it's it's the hen that rules the nest. <laughs> 
I see what That's what a lot of times it's like people, <laughs> they were able to move these men out. Because that's part of the like, kind of world teaching. It's nature. It's kind of interesting when you think about things like that. So self-identification of tribal membership. So we have a, a traditional bicultural kind of thing. And we have a bicultural or culture. So from a more of a traditional or bicultural point of view, more, like more traditional, is that they may include both traditional and Christianity or another kind of belief system. They may request traditional healers. That was something that they learned a lot in, I think, veteran studies after Korea and Vietnam, is that a lot of the natives who were going through that treatment, they wanted a... Uh, the traditionals wanted, they wanted healers to come and see them and help them. They wanted uh, sweat lodges. They wanted these things like that. So it's like um, various tribes and tribal differences. So we always kind of take that into point. And there they had a lot of differences, a lot of different tribes and things like that going in the same group. Treatment and treatment plans should fit the needs. So remembering it's like even if they're from a different tribe, from a different belief system. It's like we, we put those in there to help them. So it's more of a bicultural or acculturated, they may, may prefer Christianity or other belief system. They may request assistance from clergy. Um, remember, we cannot assume all American Indians or Alaska Natives are the same. And that we also need to remember to respect of the clients, participants' choices of their beliefs, just as we would want people to respect our beliefs. And then culturally important best practices. So this, uh, this approach respects and accommodates culture-based knowledge, skills, ceremonies, values, stories, etc. There are different ways of knowing things. <clears throat> it's like data studies, things like that. A lot of what the name it comes from old knowledge. It comes from maybe medicine people, healers, these people who have lived long ago, and they keep bringing those up. And when you look at that, evidence, science as evidence, is based on observation. A lot of our medicines and practices have been utilized with proof So practices, social services, in American Indian Alaska Native communities, um, remembering the differences and things like that, facilitates the derivation of new and improved culture-based interventions. So a lot of times when you're looking at evidence-based practices, you combine it with tribal practices for best practices. Remember, we're using the communities kind of belief systems, other kind of things with evidence. Kind of comes from like community based participatory research. One of the yeah. things that's kind of cool for those of you that are in the urban program, 70% of our folks live off the reservation as, as a general rule here in the Northern Plains. But of those 70%, 50% are going back and forth fairly often between the reservation and the urban area. So even if, so when our, our relatives mentioned the clans over here, even if if they're not from there, you know, say their relatives are a crow or wherever they're from, uh, there's still probably some relatives there in town. Mm -hmm. There's still probably someone from clan members, clan uncle, clan uncle, there in town. So, so don't give up too quick. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if they have those interests, you, you might be surprised. And someone within the family is going to know who's where and who would be a good fit. You know, they, they, so our mocks and telegraphs are pretty effective. If we ask the right people, we can find the resources. And I love wraparound approach to uh, fit, to tailor to the person, and to fit as they evolve, as they develop. Because some of us don't stay where we were, we, we progress. And so the, the ones we become because of our healing and our getting our balance back isn't the one we were. We're, we're now, we're, we're us, mm -hmm. and we're really 
changed in a good way. We're changed to our more authentic self. I love how our relatives shared that. That was beautiful. And well, sometimes, so. often, I ask them question some of those with evidence-based practice and studies with urban areas. Replicable. Because what happens is sometimes those people are living by in nearby towns near the reservation. But sometimes these towns are actually part of the reservation. So how they differentiate those, I'm not sure. There are even some tribes that are connected to like three different counties. And they're trying to count all the people within this. <coughs> <laughs> but the only thing is, usually states do not always give money to tribes, but they want our numbers. <laughs> so a lot of times what we tell people is that every tribe, they should do their own audit. And to remember to count those people who are living on the tribe or tribal members or whatever it's going to be. And making sure that the government Part of, I, I, I've not appreciated as much as I have with this pandemic. We aren't that far removed from some of the smallpox epidemic. Okay, my, I'm not trying to do trauma bonding, but my paternal grandfather, his parents died of smallpox within five days of each other in the 1800s. So it's not that far removed in my family. But it wasn't until, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but we lost a lot of people within my Tiwahe Tioshkai and Oyate within my family, my clan, and, and, and our, our nation to COVID, in addition to our usual regular deaths. This has been a very difficult time, but I've long told my kids that tradition, even though it's been used a long time, it's still contemporary because it's replicable best practice. It still serves us, it's still fresh, it's still renewed. And so when people tell me they can't change, I say, well, uh, get out of here and go in the bathroom and strip down and take a picture of yourself in the mirror and, and I don't want to see your, your ugly self for 10 years and then I want you to do it again. And then I want to look at the pictures. Because you can't stop changing, you will change. But can you change in ways that you aspire to? Can you change to ways that yourself, your higher self, your well self, desires, wants to live here, to be, to be who you came here to be? What an awesome a gift that is. So I really appreciate our, our traditional ways after this difficult time and how uh, we have a word called Daku Akaskaskan. That's a word, that's a phrase. But it, it's, it, Christian people call that Holy Spirit. Well, we, we have words for that too. <laughs> we had that experience too. We, that, that experience of life and renewal that, that you don't see it, but you feel it. And you, you experience the inspiration mm -hmm. of it. And that comes in authentic relationships. Not just with each other, but with the with the higher power, the mystery, whatever you want to call it. Uh, with the earth, with flora, fauna, with seen and unseen. I know that uh, you look at a lot of different practices within the tribes, uh, indigenous peoples of the world, really. And a lot of
lot of people, like we might go to the doctor, we might go to the pharmacy or the clinic or whatever it's like that, but then they might ask us, what else are you using for you know, your sickness or whatever it is? Well, I'm not using this herb because it really helps my cough. It's better than cough drops or whatever. He goes, well, I think you should be careful with that. No, this is not the you know. <laughs> but um, a lot of times they might say things like that. But what I usually try to bring up is, well, I understand why you're worried about it. Also, about 70% of all medications come from indigenous knowledge. Jack Weatherford, Indian Givers, great book, and he wrote two of them. He's out of Minneapolis, but a, a wonderful book. And, have any of you just sat anywhere? One of our most difficult ceremonies is Hamletiapi. We go and fast and pray for a few days and sit in one place. But we live in a culture that's very much engaged on identity based on performance. But that has to do just with being, being in relationship with earth, air, fire, and water. He's spamming right now because of fire, but we don't really think of metabolism as fire. But if, if you died suddenly, you would not be the temperature you are. So if you want to quit being hot, just die. It's not real. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's even at the temperature. <laughs> 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 I tease my wife I'm exploring my inner menopause, you know, my inner feminine. You know, you know. That's not funny. I won't. And Hamletiapi is where we stay. A lot of times, I find our kids, even you guys are doing a pretty good job staying off your phones and stuff, not entirely, but... But we need constant stimulation. I'm not trying to embarrass you. Sorry about that. I'll look over here. <laughs> that used to be our joke about the Pentecostal preacher as the lifeguard. I see that hand. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that was a bad joke, too. <laughs> okay, Sean. But, but to just be, just to be, and to be in relationship. And, and as human beings, we're not human doings in our identity is not what we do, and it's not even our role. It's a mom, or a dad, or a parent. It's as a being, as a being, as a being among other beings. It's connected to other beings, not just other beings that are alive, beings that aren't even born yet, and beings that lived before us. You know, my, uh, any of you knew Dusty Crawford, he did his DNA from our beauty, and he went back 77 generations. So my wife and I decided to do it. 32 generations ago, I was in Peru, Peru. I was hoping for a hundred generations in America. I was in Peru. So yeah, my wife's DNA, just mad at genetic genetics. Did you do that to yeah. me? Same thing? Yeah, crazy. Yeah, I always tell all mates, I don't need to do that. It's not gonna it's like and definitely don't do those ones with the last name. <laughs> like I'm only the fourth generation with the last name there in my family. Uh, fourth generation. Yeah. I already know who the water mine's going to go. <laughs> it's not going to go to another tribe. It's, you know, there are other bears, but we're not related. Or at least, maybe very distantly. <laughs> Isn't it cool, though, in our land stuff to see the names that are back a few generations mm -hmm. of people you never even heard, heard of, and here they are in your lineage somehow, mm -hmm. you know? I find that kind of fascinating. Uh, those of you that are non-native, we get uh, caught up a couple times a year on on, on land that we've never seen or heard, and it might just be a speck of dust of standing rock or something, but, but we, we're connected to someone that, that descended, we're descendants. And some of the names are pretty cool when they go before the English names and get back to the Lakota, the Lakota names, the indigenous names. I, I like that. Yeah, it's kind of interesting when you look at a lot of things like that, because I'm starting to kind of more think it's like a lot of truck long before tribes, their tribal names might have actually been clans. Mm. And they grew from there, became a tribe, and started new clans. Because it's like when you look at language, language sometimes can be pretty similar among tribes. It's like, you look at uh, Ojibwe tribes, Oji uh, Chippewa, things like that, they might say Makwa for a bear. And uh, we say Mok. And then they talk about Mato. Other tribes like that. I mean, they're similar ones. They're starting with them. Um, different kind of sounds and stuff like that. Things kind of change over time. It's crazy.
crazy you say that. My dad's, <coughs> my dad's, um, what they call Grovant, white clay. Mm -hmm. And apparently that language is pretty similar to the Crow language at one point. Oh, oh wow. I don't know. Like they, they understand each other. Uh, I, I don't know how, but. Yeah, yeah. In other words, the tribe from Mexico, they used to travel up. Our people from Mexico coming up to Iowa. Tuffy uh, Eggerson and I, he can speak Nakota, uh, and I, I pretty much can follow his conversation, or he mine, in Nakota, from uh, Fort Leonard. So, so Nakota and Nakota had to have some common roots somewhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And my maiden name is Whiteflake, and I'm a crow. <laughs> <laughs> Whiteflake, yeah. 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 She owns you. <laughs> <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> huh. <That's interesting>. <laughs> <laughs> but I noticed, like, um, like if that corner was like New York or something, and this corner was like California. So if you go in this area, and that area up on top there, if you go straight down the middle. And you have all these belief systems and all these different practices that are the same. And then eventually they started coming out. It's like ever since I was a little kid, we always grew corn, squash, and beans together. Oh, it's just in the Southwest. <laughs> and if you look across there, many of them all used some kind of woven belts, like yarn belts or something like that. Well, so there's different practices that can be very similar. And I remember speaking to Christina Pacheco one time. We were talking about processes around like uh, funerals and stuff. And it was so amazing how similar they were. Because I always ask the retrans, when you guys um, bury people or something, just like, you guys go on the grief? Um, it takes that much time for the body or the spirit to move in that the vessel there for things to come out all the way. And um, it's kind of amazing. Because if you've ever been out there, if you get lucky enough, on the very morning of that last day, it's like you can hear Mother Earth going, <sighs> it's like, because we're made of both and Mother Earth, right? Physical body and spirit. It's like she gets the last of the breath. So for the Nakota, we have the four days, they feast, right? And that's when they eat. But until they eat, they're still here visiting everybody. And it's that, it's maybe like that daybreak that you have to have it before the sun goes down. And so I guess my point in that is, Go 
count the spiders in the fruit cellar. So I finally, guess. I had that. It took me a few years until I finally found this other elder. I said, No, no, no. He goes, oh, I don't know how to ask this. He goes, What? Just ask it. He goes, Can. I need a flight to throw. Okay, let's see. For many years now, I've been asking these questions of why certain things exist. And I always got. All our elders tell us, no, you guys need to learn these things. You guys need to ask the right questions. You need to seek out those elders and learn these things. I said, but when they do, I get in trouble. I said, oh, okay. So what's your question? I ask them. And I ask them all those different questions. He goes, okay, I can answer these two. But these other ones, I'll have to ask somebody else and see if they can. What I would say is that. So, growing up, that's what I always did. I always ask questions. But that's just like my Indian name. I'm always searching. I'm always searching for things. I'm always searching for answers. I'm always searching for this or that. And, it's, and in my tribe, I noticed that people with certain names, they follow you. And their Indian name has that power, whatever, that guide them to follow that name. And it's just amazing. It's like my brother is a uh, bear. He's always getting into trouble. And boy, he follows that too. <laughs> he's always been asking him trouble. He's always gotten in trouble. And, and I was like, Mom, you shouldn't have had it. You shouldn't have given that name. <laughs> his, his firstborn's name, Kitten. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're all done here if you want to go. Uh, Thank you, guys. <laughs>